Um, welcome to this session. Thank you for so many of you who have made the time to attend. This is great to see so many of you. Um, my name is Argola, and I'm the academic librarian for the history collections at Senate House Library. And for today's sessions, we, we session, we have combined the powers of the Institute of Historical Research and Senate House Library to give you an insight into some online tools uh, and resources that are available to you to uh, do your research into British history from your home. We have four speakers with us today uh, who will introduce you to two digital resources and two libraries digital collections to support your research. First up, we have Simon Baker, the editor of the Bibliography in British and Irish History, who will give you an introduction to the bibliography and how to use it for your research. Then I will be talking to you about um, mass observation online and how you are able to access it through Senate House Library alongside other e-resources. Next up is Jonathan Blaney, the editor of British History Online, who will give you an overview over the resources that you can access with British History Online. And finally, we have Mike Townsend from the IHR Library, who will talk to you about a new resource that the library recently launched called Teaching British Histories of Race, Migration and Empire, and also other IHR Library online resources and services that are available to you online. At the end of the session, you will have an opportunity to ask us any questions that you would like to ask us. Feel free to add questions as you go as we go along with the session in the chat, um, but we won't be answering them until the presentations are over. But if something comes to mind, feel free to add it already as a question. After the session, you will be sent a bibliography and a link to the recording. Um, so don't worry if you miss anything, we will provide you with everything uh, that you will need afterwards. Uh, it might just take a few days for to arrive in your inboxes. And hopefully the session will give you some inspiration and new ideas for doing your research from home in these quite challenging times. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Simon, to start us off. Hi, everyone. Let me just set up my screen. Okay, so how to do research into British history without leaving your bedroom, or at least do as much as you can. <clears throat> Whatever restriction, the restrictions that are in place to limit the spread of COVID-19, at least there are, are many online resources for you to use, all in the comfort of your own study space. My name, as Arbler said, is Simon Baker, and I'm one of the editors of the Bibliography of British and Irish History a database of over 620,000 references <clears throat> to British, Irish and Imperial history, including the American colonies, as well as relations with other countries from 55 BCE to the present day. A curated listing of what has been written on British, Irish and Imperial history since 1909. For those doing Irish history, I highly recommend Irish History Online. As Ogla said, all links will actually be sent to you, so you don't need worry about taking any down any URLs. As an example of the global reach of BBIH, this map shows the coverage excluding the British Isles. Most references, as you can see, are for the United States, which includes the American colonies. Note the natural focus on the ex-colonies, but also France and Germany. And taking Iceland as an example, it covers early medieval Irish missions there, cultural relations, for instance, the influence of the sagas on British literature, British visitors such as the naturalist Sir Joseph Banks, foreign relations during World War II, and the Cod Wars of the 1970s. So in this short session, I'd like to take you through some basic search, how to expand your research to full text and other resources, as well as how to make the research come to you and how to use BBIH in your research. For those interested in how BBIH is compiled, and I'm sure there are lots of you out there, there is a link to a video featuring lots of cats. As with any other resource, printed or online, it's important to know where the data comes from and how it is compiled. I've also included a link to the history of BBIH. So, <clears throat> BBIH includes books, journal articles, and articles within books. 
And this is an example of a book with the bibliographical information at the top of the screen and the subject information at the bottom of the screen. And this is an article. We cover over 800 journals, everything from the Cadiensis Journal of the History of the Atlantic Region to the journal 20th Century British History. And this is an example of an article from that journal. And of course, book articles. <clears throat> Any text in green is a link to a new search. So by clicking on polity and neighborhood in early medieval Europe, you get the other chapters in that book. Note, we only document British Imperial and Irish material. So there's only three chapters in this one. You can search on these types of media, and this is a screenshot of all the, the media you can search on. You can also search via the usual bibliographical searches, such as author, title contains, journal, type of publication, as I said, year of publication, and subject searches, such as subject, subjects, places, people, and importantly, and very usefully for um, historians, the period covered. There is a short video guide to searching, which I, which I recommend. <clears throat> okay, research options. How to access material online or in your library. Make sure you're logged onto your institutional account because that will help, help in the seamless process. So if I'm looking for a book, in this case, the Oxford Handbook of Hollingshed's Chronicles, I have a number of options. You can search for your library, which may appear as different logos. I've put a selection down at the bottom. You can search on Google Books or Library Discover. I'm based at Senate House Library, and I'm taken to this screen if I search on that logo. And by clicking on the search option, I'm taken to the catalog, and you can see that this book is actually due back on 2nd of November. This is where details of online availability or ebook access will be located. Hopefully most of you will recognize the Google book search and helpfully clicking on it, you can see there is a view ebook. <clears throat> There's also the useful get this book in print option. And if you click on the find in the library and key in your location, I've entered United Kingdom here, it gives you a list of other libraries that, that hold this book. Um, this is useful for those not based in the UK or Ireland. For those based in the UK and Ireland, Library Hub Discover lists over thir lists 38 libraries. Um, Library Discover covers over 100 British and academic libraries and is a useful source of finding material. For older material, it's useful to use the Internet Archive. Here I've done a search on for the diary of Henry Machen, and there are five scanned copies available to read online. Jonathan will discuss the difference between scanned material and OCR material, that is optical character recognition. You can also search journals, but I actually find it a little clunky trying to find the search, trying to find the journals. For journal articles on BBIH and some books, there are external links at the bottom of the screen. The DOI, the Digital Object Identifier, a unique identity for articles and books is displayed and will take you to the full text, providing your institution has access. If there is no access, there's usually an abstract or a first page preview, which will help you in assessing the usefulness of the article. We also link to the journal homepage for older material with no DOIs on BBIH and to online access, access services such as JSTOR, Project News and Ingenta. So if we click on the DOI, we're taken straight through and you can see the little green tick means I have access to it and there's an abstract for it. Click on the journal homepage, you can draw down to the volume you actually require. And equally, you can go to JSTOR or to Project Muse. The British Library has a useful guide and listing for searching DOI material that can be accessed for free. It's very much geared towards the sciences, but the humanities are involved and it is a useful, a useful research tool. Make the research come to you. <clears throat> BBIH has an email alert function, which is very easy to set up. There is a video link there. Again, these will be sent to you. The email alert service allows you to save your searches and notifies you when updates contain new records. So BBIH is updated three times per year, January, June, and October, 
with roughly 4,000 new additions at each update. So this is an example of the email alert that's sent to me. I've set up two searches, one for film or cinemas, and one for intelligence, i.e. spies, with a date range of 1880 to 1939. Simply clicking on those links, I'm taken straight to the listing. As you can see, they're all flagged up with red, with new. So the, the information comes to you, you don't have to go and find, find it. And in this case study, <coughs> Tom has set up an email alert for Kinder Transport, Transport Search Anywhere, subject tree search for Holocaust to keep abreast of historiographical developments, and subject tree search for exiles and refugees with the period covered 1933 to 45. And from this, he discovered there was a similar scheme from, from the Basque region in Spain during the Spanish Civil War, where children were evacuated to Britain, and he was able to draw parallels with that. So think around your subject. <clears throat> Um, you might need to follow a particular author or a particular journal. E-alerts and RSS feeds from journals are useful and available from other databases too. So in Tom's example, he could use the journals Holocaust Studies, Genocide Studies and 20th Century British History. Journals often have reviews which can also alert you to new publications. And in this example, 20th Century uh, British history gives you advanced article notice as well. And this is an example of an e alert from Race and Class, which has come to me with a list of articles and links to those articles. So it's an easy scan of the articles to see if there's something of interest. Simply click on the link and you'll be taken straight through to it. Just as you may set up the email, email alerts for journals, it may also be useful to set to follow blog posts or Twitter accounts of particular seminars, research centers, and historians to keep up with research developments. So this is the On History blog of the IHR with the, the headings for the bibliography, and that's the IHR Twitter account. So how to help you in your research, help with citations and footnotes. The, to cite this record tool is a quick way of compiling a bibliography or of adding footnotes. Simply cut and paste. It's as easy as that. Other databases, for example, example JSTOR and Project Muse, also have this, thing, have this function. And as I said, it's a quick and easy way of citing material. You can also export references to reference manager software, such as RefWorks, EndNote, and Zotero. It saves a huge amount of time in compiling your reading lists, bibliographies, and footnoting your essays and dissertations. You simply click on the export. I've done a search here for King Henry V. There are over 200 references, and I simply click export, and you choose your option. For those who use Zotero, you'll be familiar with the Zotero icons, in this case, a yellow folder. By clicking on that, the bibliographical details of the references on that page appear, and it's a case of selecting or selecting all, and that will be downloaded into your folder. Key points when using reference manager software. Use them at the start of your search. It's just a lot easier. Choose a tool you feel comfortable with. If in doubt, ask your librarian. And as with all software, make sure you do backups. So broadening your research. <coughs> BBIH links to the Oxford Dictionary of National Bibli Biography, reviews the National Archives and British History Online. In this example of a biography of Sir Kingsley Wood, there are links to the Oxford DNB and to the TNA. So simply click on those, be taken through to Oxford Dictionary, and you can read his biography. And at the very bottom, the external sources, there is a reverse link to the bibliography as well as other sources. In this case, I would probably explore Churchill Archive. Again, get used to looking at what databases offer you so you can work out the best way of finding material. For the TNA, again, we have a reverse link back to the bibliography. And as you can see, his correspondence and air ministry papers are held at the TNA. To help in assessing works, we link to reviews, review articles, and online reviews. These helped, as I said, in assessing works under review and for historiographical analysis. So in this case, the long list of reviews for Christian slavery, conversion and race in Protestant Atlantic world 
has quite a list of reviews and you can see the little logo again and by clicking on that you can be taken to the full text. We also link to online reviews, in this case H. Albion and Reviews in History, all external links are at the bottom, simply click on them and you're taken through to those two reviews. We also link to British History Online, which Jonathan will discuss later. In this case, St. Martin's in the Fields, the accounts of the church wardens. As usual, the external link is at the bottom, simply click on it and you're taken to BHO. We're very conscious of the challenges facing university students and teachers from October 2020 and therefore have developed a help pack to get, through the, to get the most from the bibliography of British and Irish history. There are videos on searching, how to export data, setting up email alerts and connecting to external content, as well as these two videos as well. And finally, I'll end with a slide on a search for references about mass observation. Jogler will talk to you about. Thank you and good luck in your researches and I'll pass you through to Agla. Okay, hello again everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen with you again. Okay, you should... Oh, hang on, still paused. Let me just fix that. So you should all be able to see the main page of the Senate House Library website. I hope that's all working fine. Okay, let me just get back to my window. Okay, brilliant, there we go. So um, what I will talk to you now about now is uh, one of the e-resources that we have available at Senate House Library, which is Mass Observation Online. Um, so Simon has introduced you just now to how you mainly find secondary sources to complement your um, history research. But what I will now walk you through is how you can use e-resources to find digitized primary sources for your research from home. So I'm going to give you an example of one of the resources that you can access through Senate House Library. And through, for those of you who are not aware of who we are yet, Senate House Library is the central library for the University of London. Um, we are a new research library that specialises in print and electronic collections for the arts, humanities and social sciences. Among these collections, we have strong collections on British history, as well as the history of the British Empire and the Commonwealth. All students and staff of the University of London are able to use us for free, but we also have membership schemes for students and staff from other universities available and members of the public. Um, to give you an idea of the electronic materials we hold, um, as I've already mentioned, I'll just give you one example of a resource that we have access to. Um, but I will first show you how you will be able to see all our e-resources in one place. All of our e-resources are listed in the so-called e-resources A to Z list that we have available. And you can easily access this by going to databases and e-resources on our front page here. This will load up a page where you'll have to scroll down and go to accessing e-resources. And from here at the top of the page, you will see the link to the e-resources A to Z list that I just mentioned to you. We've already opened up the list for us here so we can have a closer, closer look at it. So the list here is designed to be filtered and searched in a variety of ways. You can filter it by the starting letter of the resource at the top here. Alternatively, you can filter it by different subjects. So as historians, you are likely mostly interested in two resources. So you could go to the section for history and uh, get all the relevant resources to you that way. And you can also filter by different database types, which can come in handy if you're only looking for a particular type of resource. So if you're only looking for bibliographic or citation resources or historical newspapers, for example, you can refine your search within the list a bit further that way. Or alternatively, you can just use the search box here, um, search box here to perform a simple search for the topic you're interested in researching. I will now navigate us to mass 
publishing online by just clicking on M and opening up the resource. So while this is loading, um, I will just explain to you what mass observation was. Um, mass observation was a pioneering social research organization that was set up in 1947 by the anthropologist Tom Harrison, the filmmaker Humphrey Jennings and the poet Charles Madge. Their goal was to create an anthropology of ourselves, as they called it, um, with the aim to study the everyday lives of ordinary people in Britain. In its first iteration, mass observation lasted until 1967 and was able to cover many significant developments and events of 20th century British history. The e-resource makes available all the original manuscript and typescript papers that were created and collected by the organization. And to give you an overview over what kind of material that includes, I will now navigate to the contents page to go into further detail. So um, mass observation mainly collected two different types of materials. Firstly, they collected over four uh, material from over 400 volunteers uh, from members of the public that submitted monthly diaries. And the collection of the diaries can be seen here. And secondly, they also recruited a national team of observers, which went around the country to do day surveys, which you see in this collection here. And they also responded to directive questionnaires. And a collection of the questionnaires that were sent out is in this collection here. And all the responses to the questionnaire can be found here. The data was then also gathered into different publications, such as file reports and um, other types of publications to summarize the data that was gathered. So overall, that makes it a really important and valuable resource for 20th century British social history that you can find online because it gives the experiences and voices of ordinary people a really important space to be expressed. So for this segment of the session, I will give you two examples of um, the resource. I'll first of all show you one of the diaries and then I'll show you one of the questionnaires and the responses to it. So if we click on the diaries, which I've already preloaded for you here, you will be able to see that you can filter the diaries by date range here. You can also filter them by the different numbers that the diarists were assigned. You can filter it by the date of birth of the diarist, their gender, and their place of residence, and you can also filter it by their occupation. I'll just start us out by filtering by occupation so you can get a sense of what sections of the British public were contributing to the archives. So we can see here at the top, there's quite a few entries by one person who was a housewife. She contributed quite regularly to mass observation. But if we scroll a bit further down, we will be able to see that other people also contributed from different um, parts of the public. So here is a journalist who is contributing. There is a clerk. We have a solicitor here, a teacher and reporter, and also civil servants. So there's a relatively broad spectrum represented here. I will now show you one example of one of the diary entries in the resource. And I'll choose this one here from August 1949 by the teacher and reporter that we already mentioned. And I've opened this up for you here. An example of a quite typical diary entry in the Mass Observation Online resource. At the top here, you'll find the digitized images of the diary itself. And if you scroll down the page, you'll find the metadata associated with the diary here, such as gender, date of birth, and so on. Um, in this case, this person only contributed to Mass Observation once, so she only has one entry listed here. But if someone had contributed multiple times, you could read the additional diary entries of the same diarist in this section here by choosing the expand all button. So let's have a look at the images of the diary now. I've already preloaded one of the pages for you here. Um, and this is an entry from August the 28th of 1939. So this is just a couple of days before the outbreak of the Second World War. And in her entry, she is basically, the diarist is observing the reactions of other people to the uh, recent news of imminent war. So she says here, the days seem so long while we wait for news, sat in Regent's Park, an Irish man down and out apparently said, 25 years ago, we had a war to end war. Um, 
um, at the same time for it up here on the page she's not only observing what other people are talking about she's also adding her own commentary to the situation too so as you can see here she says everybody talks to everybody else they always do in times of crisis um so i think it's quite a nice example of how a lot of these diaries show how the, the intermingling of other people being observed by just normal people ordinary people but also how it expresses their own thoughts and feelings about the historical developments at the same time so it gives us quite a singular and quite intimate insight into people's reactions at the time. So I will now move on to an example of the directive questionnaires. Um, just to show you how, again, how you go to this, so you can access the questionnaires here. But I've already preloaded the tab here of all the questionnaires. So similar to the diaries, you can filter them by different dates in this column here. But you can also filter by different subjects and for each questionnaire you can see what kind of subjects are touched upon. So to show you an example of these directive questionnaires, I've opened up one from the post-war period. This is the questionnaire that was sent out in October 1948. And similar to the images, you have the digitized image of the questionnaire at the top here. There's a bit of metadata, a bit below associated with it and just to show you what kind of uh, questions were asked in the questionnaire I've again preloaded the image so you can see what kind of questions people were asked to respond to so in this questionnaire uh, people were asked first of all to um, answer what do you consider to be the six the six main inconveniences of present day living conditions People were also asked if their attitude to any of the following things had changed since the end of the war, and if so, in what way had it changed? And the things they were asked about were money, clothes, security, people in different social classes from themselves, sex and politics. And the third question here asked to give the menu of all meals that people had on Wednesday, November 17th and Sunday, November 21st. Um, so you can see they asked quite a variety of eclectic questions in these um, questionnaires that they sent out, which is quite interesting. And one of the great things about the online version of mass observation is that every single response to your questionnaire is linked in the main entry of the questionnaire itself. So all these links down here will direct you to the response of the pe different people who responded to the questionnaire. And I've chosen one of them to show you. This one here, which again, I've just preloaded to save us some loading time. So this is the respondent entry. So, and all we'd have to do is just scroll down to the responses that this person has given, um, find the corresponding entry for the year we're looking for. So 1948, and then click on that. Doesn't seem to have done it. Um, either way, I've already opened up, so we'll just move on from there. But you should be able to just click on that link and then you will be linked through to the actual response. So, um, so this is one of the responses that they received. And for the first question, what um, this person has responded. So the, the first one was the six main inconveniences of the present time. And they responded that they find the lack of petrol lack of service, a lack of food, and a shortage of paper among the most annoying inconveniences of, of the time they live in. In response to the second question, they said um, to, in response to money that, yes, they had changed their attitudes towards that, that you shouldn't be saving it, but you should just spend it all as soon as you can. They hadn't changed their mind on clothes. They had, however, changed their mind on security and have stated that it is steadily decreasing. Again, no change on um, different people in social classes. And uh, what I find particularly funny about um, this entry here is they actually just completely skip E and go straight to F. So they completely ignore the question about sex. Um, so I think even such small omissions as this alone can give you a quite fun and interesting insight to the so into the social attitudes at the time. And below here, you have her menu of all the things that she ate at the dates that they requested her to tell them about. 
Um, so these are just two examples of the huge uh, eclectic wealth of data you can find on different people's lives and their social attitudes at in early 20th century Britain and mid 20th century Britain. And there's tons more to explore in the resource as well. So do have a look around by yourself. If you're not quite sure where to start um, with the resource, one thing I would recommend you is the topic collection that is available in the contents page here. Um, so this is just a section where they've compiled data gathered on different subjects. So that can be a quite nice way. And if you're not quite sure where to start with the diaries and the questionnaires. And another thing I'd recommend that you also have a look at if you're a bit lost is the popular searches that they've made available in this link here. The popular searches will link you to different keywords that the resource um, relates to, but it can also link you to events here and places and people and organizations too. So that can be a quite good way to start as well. So hopefully this has given you some idea of how you can use an e-resource with primary sources for your research. I will just very quickly before I hand over to you, Jonathan, um, to our A to Z list and make a few notes on accessing these e-resources through Senate House. Um, so most of our e-resources are accessible remotely with a library membership. And uh, we'll be posting you a link in the chat as well to how you can sign up for a membership online because you currently can't sign up, sign up in person, unfortunately. Um, there might be a few members of the audience who are not able to get a membership to the library um, because some of our memberships are not free of charge, unfortunately. Um, but what I can show you for those who might be in that situation is that we have also some open access resources indexed in this list here. So if something is open access, it just means that you can use it without a library membership completely for free online. So you just have to navigate to all database types again, select the category for open access, and then you will get a selection of 85 different resources here. Um, so at least we can offer you something essentially, even if you may not be able to get a library membership. So that's all from me now. I will now hand over to Jonathan Blaney, who will talk to you about British history online. Thanks, Argola, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to share my screen. Are we talking about uh, BHO, which is, as it says here, a digital library of key sources for the history of the British Isles? This is what I'm planning to cover in the next 15 minutes, if I can get through it all. So first of all, if you've never uh, seen British History Online, this is our homepage. It's a digital library. Uh, most of our content is free and everything I'm gonna show you today is free. We do have a small uh, premium content uh, section as well. And we divide our material into five categories, uh, guides and calendars, primary sources, secondary sources, data sets and maps, and I'm going to show you an example of each of those uh, briefly. Particular areas of strength in terms of history types are local history to the UK, parliamentary history, and the history of the British state. I would say that the, the sort of centre of gravity in terms of um, chronology is about 1400 to 1800, but we do have material from everything from the Iron Age through to the, the immediate present, so it's worth Whatever you're interested in, if it has to do with the British Isles, it's worth having a search on BHO. So I'm going to show you next uh, one of our calendars. Here we are. Um, we have about 500 of these, mostly calendars of state papers. Uh, let me go down a bit so you can see a bit more of the text. So calendars are summaries, they're finding aids for manuscripts in archives. And the key feature of them is that they're organised chronologically. So the archive in question here is the archive of the Cecil papers, which are held in Hatfield House. Uh, the Cecil family were advisors to um, Elizabeth I and James I. Uh, then Lord Burley here is, Cecil, is William Cecil. And so it's a summary of, uh, of this letter from the Privy Council to Burley, tells you when it was written, where, Court of Nonsuch, just outside London, uh, and in June, July the 6th, 1589. So we've got tons and tons of those. And the idea is that if you're very interested in this letter, you go to Hatfield House and you, you want to see the original manuscript of which this is just a summary. 
Um, and these are great, but um, it has to be admitted that they are uh, really focusing on the elites of the British state. So I want to show you something newer on BHO, which is a bit of a contrast. So staying in 1589, I'm going to show you a petition. Uh, and this is the petition, as you can see, of Margaret Clark, a spinster living in the village of High Lee in Cheshire. Uh, in 1589 at the quarter session so she took her petition to the local court when she could and what she's alleging here is that she a, li a Libyan servant was abused beaten up by her master's son who also threatened to cut her throat and burn her uh, she complained to the local uh, constables the first one pretended not to be at home the second one actually threatened to beat her up himself you can read this petition yourself if you want to read the details and so she's petitioning for address at the quarter sessions and so what we have here is the uh the history of a, a working class woman living in the countryside in in, six, in the 16th century which i think is a great contrast to the, the cecil papers i've just shown you maybe not exactly their own um voices in many cases because they're probably advised by scribes how to how to word things and so on but even so it's very close to that and we have seven uh, volumes of these now on BHO. I'm just going to show you something that I like from the introduction to each volume, in this case, the Cheshire Quarter Sessions, which is that our, our collaborators, our colleagues at uh, Birkbeck and UCL have put in these introductions that they've written, actual petitions, a couple of actual petition uh, photographs to give you a real sense of what it was that was transcribed. So, uh, seven, so we have about 14 of these on BHO as well, you can look at. And even uh, if you want to compare the transcription, you can practice your reading of uh, 17th, 18th century handwriting. And talking of transcription, Simon said I was going to, I would cover this and I will. This big question of uh, rekeying and OCR, optical character recognition. This is a key distinction when using any online resource, so it's well worth uh, being aware of it. Uh, those, those manuscripts I just showed you were typed out, transcriptions were typed out by experts in reading those hands, but everything we have on British History Online that's text has been typed out, including mostly what we have, which is books. So we didn't use what most online resources use, which is a computer program, optical character recognition to uh, translate the pixels from the images into text. And the, or the great thing about OCR is it's cheap and you can do mass, uh, mass digitization that way. So any big resource that you use online will have been done by OCR, by a computer program. Google Books, I mentioned already, uh, the 19th century newspapers at the British Library, many, many others. It's the only way to do it, but the accuracy varies wildly across different types of material and when the OCR was done because it's got better over the last 20 years early OCR is notably worse. Another thing to be aware of is that things like proper names which are more unusual especially um, obscure place names do very badly in OCR because the OCR program uses dictionaries to try and work out what words are so there's a favoring of more common words. Um, and that means that you just need, when you do searches, you need to be aware that with OCR material, you're not getting everything that's in there that could be found um, by a human reader. BHO, though, is, is completely rekeyed and we have very, very high accuracy rates. Sometimes when I'm checking what we get back from our keying companies, I find small mistakes. I check them against the original print volume and it's nearly always uh, a typo in the original book that has been faithfully um, transferred over to BHO, so extremely high accuracy is what you can expect on, uh, on British History Online. But because we're a relatively small uh, resource, that's, that's feasible. Local history, I'm going to show you uh, one about, we have nearly 200 volumes of the Victoria County history. Uh, here, this is the parish of Standish, which is now in Greater Manchester. Um, and just, it's always worth with BHO looking at the dates on the top. This one was published originally in 1911. So obviously uh, it's the history of Standish up to about 1910 and it's not gonna have anything from the 20th century. Uh, BCH has been going for 120 years. So we have very recent volumes as well on BHO with uh, nice color photos and things which obviously have the, the parish that's being discussed up until that moment, but some of them are much older. Um, 
And if I just go down, I can show you something. We have um, things which are still completely relevant today. So this discussion of the church and Wilfrid's in, um, in Standish is probably pretty much the church as it is today. I had a look at it on Wikipedia earlier, and I think this is probably uh, excellent information, still very detailed. But if you want the kind of modern history of Standish, you would have to look elsewhere. So let me move on now to subject guides. Um, when I uh, give these talks, I'm aware that I'm throwing lots of information at you and it's hard to know with BHO how to navigate around. So we have commissioned uh, five subject guides about how to use BHO effectively by people who are not only subject experts like Paul Seawood here, who's an expert on parliamentary history, but Paul and all the other uh, authors of these know BHO very well. So they go through what you can find on parliamentary history, of which we have lots uh, on BHO. And importantly, um, we did ask each of the authors to talk about strengths and weaknesses because we want you to use BHO critically. Um, we're certainly not saying it's the, the one-stop shop for British history, so, but this gives you a good sense of what is there, what's not there. And indeed, as Paul mentioned, uh, where else you can go, uh, other sources. So please do use those, um, those subject guides. Another new thing we just added this year is um, a thesis listing. So what we've done is we've, we've published a listing of theses in history awarded in Britain between uh, 1900 and 2014. That's about 20,000 theses. Also uh, some Republic of Ireland theses as well. So I'll just go down a little bit and show you what we have there. Um, and we've exposed, this originally was a database, so uh, we've exposed some of the database terms, which means that you can search, do a plain text search for things that are used as database terms in the vocabulary. So here's an example, index term, border officers. So if you're interested in this thesis, um, then you could do a, a text search for border officers and hope that other things have been categorised as in the index as border officer. So that's why we've exposed all of that. Now that's, this is nice, but suppose you want to read one of the theses uh, that's, that we've listed here. And you may know that the um, British Library has a, a service called Ethos, online thesis service. So we thought, well, how would it, what about if we add links automatically from our 20,000 theses to Ethos, wouldn't that be a great idea? Uh, it turned out to be a bit more difficult than we thought. Uh, but we've had this our first attempt just in this page. All these links here are links through to Ethos. You can see we haven't got everything. The one at the top, PhD London, 1988, we couldn't find that in Ethos automatically. Uh, and then the one below that is an MPhil, an Ethos only lists PhD doctoral uh, theses, so you wouldn't find that. And anything from, say, Trinity Public College Dublin uh, would also not be an Ethos because it's UK only. But Given that we've got quite a few of them here, and I'm just gonna click through and show you. Uh, I'm gonna look at this one, cricket class and colonialism. Uh, if I open that in a new tab, it should take me through to the thesis on ethos. Notice um, that it's slightly differently spelt here. They said in this title, it's two elites as a number, and back on BHO, it's two elites as a word. This is one of the problems we have with matching. If we make the matching too fuzzy, uh, we, we get the wrong thesis. And if we make it not fuzzy enough, we don't get anything. So we've had to try and find a balance. But this one goes through, it gives you a nice full summary of what the thesis is about, the abstract written by the author of the thesis. Sometimes Ethos actually has the thesis online and you can download it from there. In this case, it doesn't, but this one at the University of Edinburgh, there's a link straight through to the repository there. And if I follow that, here's the thesis in Edinburgh's research archive. And if you click on this, which I did earlier, you can download the PDF of this thesis and read it straight away. So uh, we are planning to add um, the rest of the pages with links to Ethos through, um, through the autumn. So if, if there are things that we don't get automatically, it's still worth searching Ethos because a more kind of uh, rough search with the author's name and a bit of um, guesswork about search terms might well find it. Last thing I want to mention before I stop are maps. We have um, a complete set of 19th century ordnance survey maps. 
This is where I'm speaking to you from, slightly later in time. I think nearly all these fields are gone, so I'm going to zoom in. This, I'm in Acton in West London. Um, that's Wormwood Scrubs there. I'm actually slightly south of Wormwood Scrubs um, here. And if you zoom in, you can zoom and pan, and then it does resolve to better quality. Uh, this, is, this is pretty much exactly where I am. Um, and what's happened since, the, you see the nursery there above the road, that's all now made into a park. Uh, but the railway line is still there. That's now the overground line. Acton Station is still there. And these arm arms houses are still there. But all around these fields are all houses now, including one that I'm in about here. So it's, it's um, a nice way to explore what's changed. Just be a little bit careful with the dates. This, because obviously this mapping took a long time. This map of Middlesex here took 15 years. So if you want to know exactly when a feature uh, occurs on the map, you'll have to do a bit of detective work working out exactly when this bit of the map should have been um, should have been mapped because you know you have to find a, a feature which appeared at a certain point in that date range but it'll give you a good idea. So that's all from me. I'm going to hand over now to um, my colleague Mike from the IHR library. Thank you. Thank you Jonathan. Right let me just uh, share my screen here. Right. Hopefully that's the right one. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mike Townsend, uh, one of the collection librarians uh, here at the IHR. And I'll just talk to you briefly about some of the library's research tools and a couple of ways in which you can currently access our physical collections as well. So let's get there. So library. Connections, it's been a bit slow, there we go, and down here, so, okay, so uh, during lockdown, uh, the library has been busy creating a couple of uh, resource portals that will point researchers in the direction of relevant digital resources and projects. Uh, there is a general list of resources, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Uh, but and the one on British histories and of race, migration, and empire, which I'll discuss now. This page was uh, launched in the August of this year, in collaboration with the Runnymede Trust, and it aims to list as many freely accessible uh, resources as possible, relevant to the study of uh, British, Black, and Asian history, as well as histories of UK migration uh, and the history of British colonialism. Right. So let's have a walk through. Right, so scrolling down the page, you'll see it's divided uh, into a number of sections and subsections. Uh, for example, there are lists of resources relevant to school pupils from key stages one to A level, uh, as well as a section listing resources and contacts um, useful for teachers, tutors, and professionals working in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, otherwise known as the GLAM sector. We also have two large sections towards the beginning and the end of the page, listing resources for gen that might be of interest to general audiences and university students and uh, researchers. So to open a section, it's very simple. Uh, just click on the cross at the end of the section title. This will bring down a uh, drop-down list, listing the resources in that section together with their URLs uh, and brief descriptions of what they are. Uh, and to close the section, again, it's very simple, just click on the cross again at the end of the section's title. Right, so this is an ongoing project and so far over 150 resources have been listed. Um, if you know of any resources that might be relevant for this page, you can contribute uh, by clicking on the web form link. Let me just bring that up, right, just there. The web form link um, at the top of the page and filling out relevant details. And in the meantime, feel free to ex uh, explore this grain resource. It's it's well worth having a having a look around. So similarly, in March of this year, uh, we put together a resource portal, which again sought to also list as many freely accessible resources that might be of use to history or researchers of all kinds. 
And since that time, links to over 750 resources have been put on this page. Again, if we scroll down the page, and this is a bit larger, uh, you can see it's, it's structured quite similar to the, um, the page on race, migration and empire, obviously with different sections. Um, of particular reference uh, relevance today, let's go down. We have the medieval section. So let's go into documentary sources. So it, oh, let's stop there. Okay, so things like, it lists things like the Henry III Fine Rolls project and things like that. Uh, right. And uh, we also have subsections on Britain and Ireland in the early modern and modern periods. So again, this is well worth having an explore. So, so Bess of Hardwick's letter, that might be quite interesting to look through. So they, we also, there are other sections further down the page um, that might list additional relevant material, um, especially those on local history, or well, we've got set sections on garden history as well, which might be of interest, but local history, um, as well as uh, geographic and area sections. Let's go further down on Africa, China, South Asia, and Australia and New Zealand, uh, which may be of um, interest to anyone um, interested in the history of uh, the British Empire or colonialism. And just like the page on race, migration, and empire, if we go up the top again. Right. All right. Um, you can. Um, Suggest possible resources that might, you know, that you feel should be added to this page by filling out. Again, there is a suggestion box, which is just another form, or you can email uh, the library directly here at ihr.library.atlondon.ac.uk. So let me go on to the second part of my. Right, okay. Right, okay. So you may be aware that the IHR Library does have some of the largest uh, history collections in the UK and, and as it stands at present, there are a couple of ways you can still access them. Right, uh, we have extensive collections of uh, published primary sources, bibliographies and archive guides, as well as some reference works on the general histories of Britain and Ireland from the early medieval period to the present, as well as large collections on local history. Um, if anyone's interested in Roman Britain, I, should, I recommend that you um, check out the Institute of Classical Studies. Right. And here I've highlighted some of the strengths of our British collections. With our focus being on collecting published primary sources, as, as, as you may expect, uh, we have amassed large holdings on, of published letters, diaries, memoirs and autobiographies. <clears throat> We also have large collections of published institutional and government records. Many of the physical calendars of state papers, various medieval roles and Privy Council records that some can be found, well, many can be found on BHO, are within our collections. Plus we have extensive church history sources, including British medieval cartularies, British, uh, bishops visitation registers, as well as sources on the Reformation, as well as modern church history. And for anyone interested in local history, our English, Irish, Welsh, and Scottish collections all have uh, local history subcollections, which include runs of local history society publications, some of which stretch back, stretch back to the 19th century. We also have a number of English antiquarian county histories published in the 18th and 19th centuries, such as the History and Antiquities of Somersetshire um, by William Phelps, and I think that's a little picture down here. Uh, and the History and Antiquities of the County Palatine of Durham by um, Robert Surtees. And of course, any discussion of English local history is not complete without mentioning the Victoria County history. Um, we have runs of their uh, Red Book Parish by Parish Histories, Histories of England, uh, which they have been publishing from the late 19th century to the present, as well as their more recent publications on specific towns and cities. Although a different part of the Institute, you can find out more about the VCH and, and also its um, uh, equivalent centre, uh, the centre of the history of people, place and community via the um, uh, 
the links in the bibliography or um, ex exploring the history.ac.uk site. Right. Okay. Uh, to get an idea of what we have in the library, you can browse our growing list of collection guides as well. So currently we have ones on British history in general, um, English local history, uh, black history and UK parliamentary history, as well as others including London history, Welsh history, Scottish history and Irish history. We've also got a number of thematic guides which highlight many items from our British collections, including ones on archaeology, architecture, genealogical research and transport history. Other collections that may also be of interest include our large colonial collections, um, as well as um, our ones on military history and international relations. Right, to search our collections, use our online catalogue. Uh, like most catalogues, you can do uh, a keyword search as well as title and author searches if you know exactly what you're looking for. Uh, you can even broaden your search to other libraries such as those in the Warburg Institute, the, again, the Institute of Classical Studies, and the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, as well as Senate House Library as well. Although you'll have to check with them uh, about accessing material from their respective libraries. And I think I'm just mentioning as well, something that Simon mentioned earlier. Earlier, We have the link there to Library Hub Discover, which was um, that uh, online catalog that basically searches hundreds of UK academic library catalogs at once. So that's a use, uh, definitely a useful tool to, to use. So, okay, so what's the point in talking about our collections if you can't actually get here? <laughs> uh, there are currently two ways that you can access them. Since July, we have been uh, running a free scanning service. It's currently free. So if you find a section of a work uh, you would like to consult, but visiting us isn't currently possible or practical, uh, just email us the details. And as long as it obeys copyright restrictions, uh, we will email the scans to you. I'm just going very quickly through this. It's also possible to actually visit us at the moment as well. If you choose, you will need to book a place in advance and if possible, let us know the works uh, you'd like to consult. Both can be done via um, uh, the form available from the URL history.ac.uk forward slash IHR dash library dash reader dash access dash update. But I think that's just at the bottom of the slide there. Also, as with other parts of the Senate House building, a uh, face covering will need to be worn during your visit. And so, to summarise, even if the situation changes over the coming months, which it, well, over the coming days, which it probably will, uh, you can still access resources via the library. If another national lockdown is imposed, the resource portals are still there uh, for you to consult. If a partial lockdown is put in place and the library is closed to readers, we can still offer our scanning service. And of course, at present, you are welcome to use all these services as well as book a place to visit the library if you wish. But before wrapping up though, uh, I would be remiss not to mention the large series of seminar programs listed on the IHR website. Here are some of the programs specifically about various aspects of British history, but it's also worth exploring some of the other programs which often have papers relevant to British history as well. They're now delivered largely online. So if there is anything of any interest, interest explore our listings. I think um, the, the link should be in the chat box or it will be in, in the um, bibliography we send at the end. So, and the IHR has also recently launched um, an archive of recordings of past events as you can imagine, this will grow quite substantially over the coming academic year. So regularly check um, which new recordings have been added. So, and lastly, uh, getting back to the library, if you'd like to request a scan or even visit us in person, just join the library. It's easy and it's free to everyone. Within the library pages of our website, go to join the library or perhaps it's easier to go to the um, URL listed on the slide here. So library membership join. I think that will be in the chat box as well. Uh, where you, you'll be asked to fill out a short online form and uh, we can either send you, you give the option that you can either, we can send you your um, library card to you in the post or you can collect it in person. We also here have our contact details. So if you've got any follow-up questions at all, uh, don't hesitate to let us know. So that's 
my presentation just so I've finished speaking now, so I think we're now we're just going to pass on now to the last section of today, which is a Q and A. Sorry, just had to unmute myself. There we go. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm aware that it's already four o'clock, so we may have to go. Um, we did overrun a little bit further as planned, apologies. Um, but hopefully you got a lot of the session. Before you go, um, I would just also like to make you aware of one event that we're holding together uh, as two institutes. So this is an event that Senate House Library and the Institute of Historical Research are organizing together on the 19th of November called History Day 2020. And this is an event where you can discover over 50 different history collections across the UK. There will be a um, very broad um, program of live events during the day where different libraries will give you online tours of their collections. And we also have free panel sessions that are going to talk about various uh, topics that concern history, especially in this year. We have one session on archiving during 2020, where we also have someone from Mass Observation online on the panel. So thank you to the person who mentioned in the comments that Mass Observation is still running. So yes, we will have them represented there. We also have a panel on exploring history in the digital world, and another one on local and community history, which is run together with the Centre for People, Place and Community at the IHR. So if you are able to join us, do sign up. Um, it's going to be a great event, I think. I would say that though. Um, but um, do feel free to come along if you have the time. I'm sure you'll find something that's to your taste there. Now we're going to move on to the Q&A. Um, I'm just going to put up our contact slides for you though, in case some of you want to get in contact with us and have to leave now. Feel free to get in touch with us anytime, but we're now very happy to also take any questions you may have. I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat. I saw a few ones already that we can have a look at. Hang on, I just need to actually get to the chat window. I might actually have to stop sharing my presentation because otherwise I can't see the chat. Sorry about that. There we go. Good. Um, I saw a question for up. I don't know if this person is still there who was asking about access to the bibliography. Um, they said they had a standard library card and uh, the bibliography is grayed out when they go to the Breckles page. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by a standard library card. Does that mean you have a library card to the IHR library or Senate House or another library? I don't know if the person is still there to answer. I did privately chat with, I think it was Lily, and I asked her if she'd need to check with her li library because I have access to UCL with a certain card. I don't have access to the electronic resources. Okay. That's one of the things if you're a member of a different library than the one you're established at. So that might be a problem, or they might just not subscribe to BBIH in itself. Um, although I think most British universities do and all the Irish universities do. So um, she'd be very unlucky if she's in that university that doesn't have it. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to look for a few other questions that we've got through. Um, so someone did ask about, um, so someone contacted us who is a private independent researcher working on mid-Tudor history and they have an ordinary li library membership and they were asking about how much of British history online is accessible to them online. So maybe Jonathan, you could take that question. Sure, yeah, we have about um, 1300 volumes on BHO and about, um, I think about a thousand of them are free. So 75% or so we think is, is free. Um, if you do want to subscribe personally, it's £35 a year. So it's not, you know, we think it's reasonably competitive. But the other thing to mention, which also goes back to the question about BBIH, if you're a member of an institution or a library, including even a public library that doesn't um, subscribe to any resource you want, it is worth asking librarians to consider um, with subscribing because that's how they gauge what the public demand is from people asking. So I always think it's worth talking to your librarian if you can't get access to anything. Uh, but anyway, the, yeah, so most of BHO is, is free. And there's not much in the Tudor period. The only thing that's really not free, I think, well, actually the, the kind of Henry VIII period, it's all free. Uh, the Elizabethan 
era is probably just the uh, calendar of state papers domestic. So if you wanted those, that's in the premium content, but the rest of it is all free to anybody. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat currently, um, unless I've missed something. I'll just quickly double check. I think we've answered everything and for now. There's a question about scanning. Yeah, I think Gemma linked to that. Um, but yeah, we can ask that question as well. So as someone was asking if the IHR scanning service is free. Yes. Yeah, it is currently free. So. Okay. So if you have any further questions, we're happy to hang around for a few more minutes if you would like to ask anything else. Um, someone has asked if the slides will be distributed after the call. Yeah, just to reiterate that, yes, we will um, give you the recording as well as a bibliography after this session as well. Um, and the recording will obviously include the slides that you have just saw seen on screen. So yeah, you will get those in the next couple of days once everything is ready and uploaded. I think most people are running out of questions, but we're getting a lot of thank yous. Um, so um, I think we're just at the end of the session now, really. So I would like to thank you all for coming. It's, it was really great to see you all. It's a, quite amazing that we got so many numbers and we hope the session was useful to you. As already said, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to get in touch with any of us at any time. And I wish you a great rest of the day. Thank you very much for coming again. Thanks everyone. Best yeah. of luck with your research as well. <laughs> Good luck.